Hard to sit in corset, yes. Sometimes I find it's easier if you kind of perch forward. All righty. Uh, yeah, you put like three of those and then one of the real marshmallows. <laughs> All right, it's about 11 a.m. on a Sunday morning at a convention, which means most of us are probably still recovering from last night. Uh, I am not because I had a five-year-old with me, and it's kind of hard to go out and enjoy yourself when you're keeping an eye on a five-year-old. Have any of you been here for my candy panel in the past? So you know what to expect, and you're probably here for the samples. <laughs> there you go. Um, my name is Shauna. Uh, I go by SDR on the internet, so if you ever want to look me up, it's spelled phonetically, E-S-D-E-E-A-R. Um, I've been experimenting in candy making for probably about four years now. I've been doing this particular panel at Anacrocon for the last three. This is my third time. For some reason, they keep asking me back. Not sure why. So, as usual, the technology is not quite what I was expecting. I had a nice little slideshow planned, and there's no projector or anything else. I will attempt not to speed read through my slides, which is what happens when I don't have the actual slide for you guys to look at. But if I do, that just means you have a greater area for Q&A at the end. And I will answer any questions about pretty much anything. So if you have cooking questions in general, feel free. So this is officially titled, unlike what it said on the program guide, A Narrative on Candy, which is candy making in the Industrial Revolution and how we can do it today, which it's really not as difficult as you would expect it to be. And that's my fancy little slide, which you guys can't see. It has a spin up, and it says, nobody expects the Industrial Revolution with a loud noise. So, you know, just imagine, use your imagination. Um, also, a disclosure, I am videotaping, and I will put it up on YouTube, but usually the audio isn't great enough where you guys will be picked up, so feel free to not worry about being out on the Internet. All right, so sugar, the 18th to 19th century. Mostly in the early years, sugar was a very restricted com commodity. And that's because sugar was such a hard process to do. You really only saw it if you were rich, because it just took too much effort to produce the fine white sugar that we know today. Um, conversely, also, candy was something that you only had if you were rich and an adult. So while we think of candy as a children's thing nowadays, it was something that you only got when you were full grown. Children didn't get to eat it like they do now. However, because of worldwide leaps in machinery during that time period, suddenly it became something everyone could get a hold of. So it went from being upper class to kind of middle, lower class type thing. Uh, there was a huge upsurgence in boilermakers, which is a very key part of the whole sugaring process. You take a sugar cane, you pound it down, you dehydrate it, and you're left with sugar, just like you do with salt water. They do with salt. Uh, and because they were able to suddenly mass produce all this sugar, like I said, it became a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, I have a quote here from Henry Weatherly from his Treatise on the Art of Boiling Sugar from 1864, which I wish I could take credit for finding this quote, but is actually from a book which I neglected to bring with me, a, a very wonderful book uh, called Sweets, The History of Candy. It covers, I am covering mostly just sugar candy. I'm not covering chocolate, because chocolate is a whole other entity in the candy making world. And I'm not quite pronounced enough to experiment with chocolate making. But his quote goes, the large increase in the consumption of sweets made from boiled sugars in the United Kingdom during the last, last quarter of a century has arisen principally from the cheapest and the facility of manufacturer derived from the introduction of machinery. So basically everything I just said. Now we're going to move from the United Kingdom to the U.S. We had a lot of milestones here in the U.S. Uh, the lozenge, lozenge cutter, one of those words that looks amazing on paper and really hard to get out of your mouth. Uh, the first candy machine, it was originally created for making cough drops. 
Cough drops usually had a lot of really terrible tasting things in it. Pour enough sugar in there, everyone will want, want to eat one. So they just, just uh, developed a machine that allowed them to cut the hard candy process into tiny little chunks. And that was the first official candy making machine. Uh, fairy floss, or what we know as cotton candy, was introduced at the World's Fair. Uh, our first lollipop machine was called Born Sucker, which basically just took hard candies and stuck a stick in it. That way you could walk around and enjoy them as you go. And the one thing I really wish I could afford to get, an individual candy wrapper. Because right now, that's my individual candy wrapper standing right there, my younger sister. Uh, it's not as difficult as you would think, but when you make a batch of candy and it comes out with like 50 pieces and you're sitting there trying to tie up all 50 pieces. Um, do you want to take around the salted whiskey caramels to give everyone just kind of a tide over at this moment? So that I think I think a couple of you can, even if you've already had one today, you can have another. There are plenty. Also of note, Chicago of all the places in the U.S., became the candy center and launched the National Confectioners Association so they could regulate all the processes of candy making and what went into candy and you know how it was wrapped and produced and everything else. Yes, those are made with uh, Tennessee honey Jack Daniels. So you should just kind of get a subtle honey flavor. <coughs> all right. Yet another thing that if you had a slide, it would be much more impressive. I have the definition of candy. Candy is a noun. The plural is candies. One, crystallized sugar formed by boiling down sugar syrup. Two, a confection made with sugar and often flavoring and filling. B, a piece of such confection. Or three, something that is pleasant or appealing in a light or frivolous way, like visual candy or arm candy or, you know, that sort of thing. So when you talk about candy, you're pretty much talking about something that is made with boiled sugar, which if you've never boiled sugar before, it gets, it's very exciting. <laughs> when I get into the science portion, man, I have some stories to tell. But, uh, yes. Candy making does equal science. It's a simple science. It's not like baking. Baking, you pretty much have to follow the directions. There are some areas where you can tweak little things like the flavorings and you know other additives, but if you don't have the right amount of flour, salt, you know, baking powder or soda or you know yeast, you're gonna wind up with either a brick or Cthulhu coming out of your oven. You know, it's, it's not the great thing. Uh, rules when making candy. Use a thermometer, especially if you are just starting out. Because while there are techniques to do candy without a thermometer, they, they call it the cold water test, where you drop bits of your uh, syrup into the water and see how the texture turns out. Unless you have experience in candy making, it's going to be one of those things where it's, it's hit or miss. You, you may think that you've got it, and you drop it in, and suddenly you've cooked it too long, and there's really no coming back from cooking it too long. So I highly recommend thermometer. If you're going to get a thermometer, you want to get a digital thermometer. They are the best things ever. Most of the time, they come up with a little alarm on them that when it gets close to your temperature, it will go off. Because it's really easy to forget that you are cooking something, especially if you're like me and you have a younger niece who likes to come in and distract you at any given moment. You don't want to leave your sugar unattended. I have burnt far too many batches. I have wound up with toffee instead of caramel. It is just a long line of things that you really want a thermometer. Digital thermometers are best. You can usually find them in Walmart. Make sure you're buying a candy thermometer and not a regular cooking thermometer like a meat thermometer because they do differ. I once attempted to make cheese with the wrong type of thermometer, and instead of having mozzarella, I had ricotta because I cooked it too hot, not realizing that the measurements on the thermometer are different. When you're first starting out, do follow the recipe because it's there as a guide. Unless you've made the recipe before or you've seen the recipe made before, follow it. You can always experiment later. 
And that way you also know if you do something different from the recipe and it turns out differently, you don't know if it's because you did something wrong, if it's something you made a difference in, or if it was the recipe itself. Because there are a lot of recipes on the Internet. The Internet is a glorious thing. I love the Internet. You can pretty much Google anything. But you can come across some stuff that if you're not familiar with cooking, candy making, following directions in general, it, it can really mess you up. And be prepared for surprises. Do any of you know about Turkish Delight? Have you ever had Turkish Delight? Hold on. Excuse me, my phone is going off. Turkish Delight is one of those things, if you've never made it, it will, it will surprise you. It's basically cooking cornstarch until it gets thick. But there is this tiny moment where it becomes the perfect thickness, and then it leaps into, oh my god, what is happening? This sludge is, you know, attempting to eat my face. I made uh, Turkish Delight twice for panels, and I have not made it since just because it is so finicky, and it's really kind of an acquired taste. If you get the opportunity to make Turkish Delight, I recommend doing lemon or orange or a normal flavor. Rose water will confuse your friends and family. It tastes like soap. Yes. If, if, if you're not used to having a flowery flavor, they'll ask you why are you feeding them soap. <laughs> Several times. But candy making is, is great. The one thing I do love about candy making is a lot of times, even if you mess up with most of the simpler recipes, you still have something you can eat. I mentioned toffee, which is just the caramel recipe cooked at a higher temperature. Uh, temperature is a key factor in candy making. You have, like, you start at the bottom with candy making, a thread temperature is from 250 Fahrenheit to, or 230 Fahrenheit to 235. Again, you know, like I mentioned before, there's very little leniency as far as the temperature goes. Next is softball. Softball is 235 to 240. And what these terms are referring to is, I mentioned the cold water test. If you drop it into cold water, how will the syrup or substance react? Uh, from 230 to 235, it'll form a thread as it drops through the water. When you drop it in at 235 to 240, it'll usually form a soft ball, which means it'll form a ball in the water, but when you reach in and pick it out, it'll flatten out in your hand. A firm ball is 245 to 250, which, drop it in, makes a ball. When you lift it up, it shouldn't flatten in your hand. Hard ball, 250 to 265. Again, drop the ball, pull it up. You should be able to squares, squares it, squeeze it, and it will have some give to it, but it won't, you know, it won't give very easily. Then you have your cracking temperatures. This is where when you make hard candy, toffee, that sort of thing. Uh, 270 to 290 is a soft crack. It's not going to break your teeth if you try to bite into it, but it will still crunch. Uh, usually brittles are around that temperature or toffees. Uh, when you go between hardball to soft crack, that's where you go from caramel to toffee. Um, I've also not gotten it hot enough and wound up with caramel sauce. Is when you, you, know, you cook it and you think it looks great and you put it in the fridge and then you go back to cut it and it just kind of pours out of the pan. It's delicious. It's fantastic. But it's not caramels. It's really difficult to wrap in that, in the, that manner. And then you have hard crack, which is 300 to 310, which is really, really, really hot and borderline on burning your sugar. You've got to be really careful when getting your temperature up that hot. So we're going to start out with the easiest of candies to make. And I think I, I sped right along again tonight because we're already in science. And I am only, my phone's not waking up. I'm only 15 minutes in. So I'm going to talk slower. We will start with the pure and simple cinnamon hard candy, which the ingredients are two cups of water, uh, two cups of sugar, one cup of water, half a cup of light corn syrup, one quarter to one half a teaspoon of cinnamon oil, and half a teaspoon of red food coloring. You can leave out the food coloring if you want, but, you know, really, do you want to eat a cinnamon hard candy that's not bright red and turns your tongue colors? Not me. Now, if you may have noticed, there were two types of sugar in that recipe. 
you had your two cups of sugar. Presumably, if it says sugar, it's going to be granulated white. If it doesn't specify, you can safely assume it's going to be granulated white. Um, it also has the corn syrup. And the reason for this is if you cook just the granulated white sugar with water and add all your ingredients, you're going to wind up with sugar crystals. If any of you have ever, you know, in elementary school done that experiment where you mix sugar and water, you know, hot water together, and then you put a string in there and the sugar crystals form, they're tasty, but it's, that's pure sugar. It doesn't give you the same consistency. You want to add a sugar syrup, such as corn syrup, maple syrup, anything that's a liquid sugar, because then that will give you a smoother mouthfeel. It will give you a smoother consistency in the candy itself. Now, my assistant here is going to bring around, don't, don't get excited, you're just trying the red ones. She's going to bring around the cinnamon hard candies, the square ones that are unwrapped are my homemade. They will be very strong, but they will mild out really quickly. Uh, and then the wrapped ones are just regular store-bought at Walmart red candies. So like I said, the, the, the square ones will be really strong at first, but they should mild down quickly. One of the differences between store-bought candies and homemade candies is store-bought candies have a lot of times other additives to prolong like the cinnamon flavor. That way you get the same flavor throughout the candy. However, the homemade, you get that burst at first, and then it kind of it, it settles down, yes. It, it's so much fun giving these things to a five-year-old. Uh, I'll, I'll do a quick read of what is in the store bottle. You've got corn syrup, sugar. If you're not familiar with the way ingredient labels work, the first ingredient will always be the largest amount, and then it goes in descending order. So with these candies, the majority of the sugar in it is from the corn syrup. Are we surviving out there? Are we making it through? Uh, and then regular sugar, natural and artificial flavors, red 40, red 3, blue 1, and yellow 6. So, as you can see, there's some artificial stuff in there. It, I'm not going to say that store-bought is not as good as homemade, except when I say store-bought is not as good as homemade. There are benefits to store-bought. Like I, like I mentioned the store-bought candy, you'll have the same consistency flavor-wise. You know when you buy a bag of store-bought candy, it's pretty much going to be the same thing every time you walk in and buy a bag. You cannot really guarantee that when you make it at home. Uh, when we move on to the caramels, caramels tend to have the same consistency. However, a lot of times your home atmosphere will affect your candy making. Last year, we had snowpocalypse, terrible, terrible cold, you know, snow, ice, everything else, and it did affect my candy. When I brought the caramels in, they were exceptionally difficult to cut because the temperature difference had caused the cooking process to get hard at a lower temperature. Pretty much the science between you know, cooking it is the hotter the temperature, the more water you've cooked out. So when you've cooked out, you know, a lot of water, you're going to be left with a hard candy. And unfortunately, like I said, the cold temperatures, uh, a lot of places lost power, and my house was just unbearable. We were snowed in. I wasn't able to bring the cinnamon hard candies last year because I couldn't get sugar to make them. Um, but, yeah, the atmosphere does make a difference. If you're trying to make caramels, especially in the south during the summer, the humidity will probably cause them not to be able to firm up because there's just too much water in the air. So that's kind of one of those things you need to keep in mind. But with store-bought stuff, they're able to control pretty much every aspect of the process. So you can trust that when you're buying a bag of cinnamon hard candies from the store, what you buy today, what you buy next week, what you buy next year is always, knock on wood, going to be the same. Now the interesting thing with the hard candy recipe is you can put any flavor or color into it that you want and get the same thing. This is the cinnamon oil that I used. I used an entire bottle. Uh, it's referred to as a dram. You can actually find this nowadays at Walmart, which I think is fantastic. When I first started making candy, I had to search all the specialty craft stores in the Wilton cake making section. 
this is by Lorian Oils. Um, you do want to make sure you use a oil as opposed to the extract, which you buy on the shelf at Walmart. You can probably, you, where I found this was, like I said, at the wilting cake making section of the craft area um, in Walmart. Uh, if you buy the extract, it's just not going to give you that same flavor punch. And probably the reason why this has such a strong effect when you first eat it, as opposed to later on, is because oil tends to rise, and you do add the flavoring at the end. That way you don't burn the flavor. If anyone wants to fight each other over it, feel free to take that home. Because I'm not making cinnamon hard candies for another year, and I think I still have three of them. Ah. So that's cinnamon hard candy, or hard candy in general. The very first time I made hard candy, you, you have the pro process where you cook the sugars together, then you add this, the flavoring at the end. I cooked the sugars a little too long, and they got toasted. And what I wound up was something that tasted like a toasted marshmallow instead of a cinnamon hard candy. Because I also used extract at that time instead of using the oil. So while it wasn't terrible, it wasn't you know something that I could go, hey, it's a cinnamon hard candy. And they go, hey, you're trying to fool. It's not a cinnamon hard candy. Now, something that's a little trickier to make, but still relatively easy, or caramels. With caramels, the difference between a caramel and a hard candy is you're adding something with a fat content. And the fat content causes the sugar syrup to change in consistency. Um, in the case of the recipe you're going to be trying, it's heavy cream and butter. There is a cup of heavy cream, one quarter of a cup of corn syrup, one fourth of a teaspoon of salt, four tablespoons of butter, and it looks like somehow the recipe left off the granulated sugar, which to my recollection is a cup and a half, and a, quart, a half teaspoon of vanilla, just to give it a little extra something something. The gourmet touch. Yes, the gourmet touch. <laughs> so again, you start with the syrup. You almost always, when you're making a candy, start with the syrup, because you want to dissolve your sugar into the liquid before you add everything else so that you avoid having a gritty mouthfeel. If you've ever made fudge, if you know you bite into fudge and it generally has almost, I, I don't want to call it a sandy texture, but it definitely has a different texture from biting into a caramel, that's because generally you don't melt the sugars down as, as, as well as you do when you're making caramels or hard candies. Uh, if we want to give out the caramels next. Now, these caramels are just the simple, no added, no salt, other than the you know tiny bit that you do for the recipe. And then the hand-wrapped ones are the homemade, and the square-wrapped ones are the, which ironically, when I, I'm from Columbia, South Carolina, and they were out of these caramels when I went to buy some. So I had to shop at Walmart in Atlanta to find caramels to give to you guys. And again, in this bag, we have corn syrup, sugar, skim milk, palm oil, whey from milk, salt, artificial natural flavor, and soy lecithin. A lot of people have that old adage that if you can't pronounce it, don't eat it. Well, you're not going to be eating a whole lot of stuff if you follow that. Again, not necessarily saying that store-bought are worse. Uh, they, they do serve their purpose. If you want to make caramel apples, and you don't mind sitting there and wrapping caramels for a, a long time, or if you don't have time to do the caramel process yourself, these, these are a fantastic, fantastic thing to do. They will last longer. Uh, anything you make at home has a limited shelf life. I cannot say for certain how limited the shelf life is because they never last that long in my house. But uh, like, like these, the sell-by date is the 29th of August of this year. And I can guarantee you that if you set the simple caramels on your shelf by the 29th of August, they'll probably not be anywhere near as tasty as these. That was a lot of noise. So caramels. I've mentioned accidentally making sauce. I've mentioned accidentally making toffee. You can burn them. And when you burn them, they tend to get bitter. And I'm not, I'm not talking about like the burn where it's too hot. I'm talking about the burn where it starts to stick to the bottom of your pan. 
Um, and you get little black bits all throughout. It's not easy to do that, especially if you are using a candy thermometer, but it is tricky. Another thing to keep in mind when you're using a candy thermometer, they tend to clip to the side of the pan. So you want to make sure you have a pan that doesn't have a lip on it. Otherwise, they won't clip very well. I have a specific saucepan that I use pretty much solely for making candy because it is flat on the sides and most other pans nowadays, they make them with a lip that way the, the lid fits on fleshly. However, I love making them with a thermometer so I have to use this one specific pan. However, the pan is kind of larger. If you are making something that is not gonna bubble up a lot, with caramels, when you add the fat content, it bubbles up, so you wanna make sure you have plenty of room in your pan. However, when you're making hard candy, it tends to stay kind of low in the pan. You have to make sure your thermometer is deep enough into the syrup that it's registering the temperature properly. I almost messed up this batch of hard candy because I forgot to double check where my thermometer prong was hitting, and it was hitting towards the top, so it was not reading that it was getting as hot as it was getting. And the only reason that I recognized my mistake was because I happened to glance at the pan and noticed that it was starting to turn a slight shade of tan which is what sugar does when it gets really hot. So I said, huh, that's interesting. And I kind of pushed down on the thermometer and the temperature started jacking up. And you can tell the difference between hitting the pan. Again, you don't want it too deep because if it hits the pan, it'll register as being too hot. But the temperature started jacking up and I said, oh, I need to pull it off and add my seasoning. But again, that's another reason why you need to kind of be a little more experienced before you start playing with your recipes. If I hadn't made it in the past, I would have just been sitting there like, oh, well, the you know thermometer doesn't say 290 yet, so it must be fine, and I would have wound up with a pan of black sugar, which is not tasty at all. I can say from experience, not tasty at all. But with the caramels, when you, you start out with the syrup, you cook the syrup to not typically a temperature, but to a uh, texture or coloration caramels, you, you would think that you're cooking it to be dark, but the colorization comes later with the cooking of it with the cream and the sugar, or the, I'm sorry, the cream and the butter. So you don't want it to get too dark in the pan when you're just doing the sugar process. Then you add in the cream, and you add in the butter, and it blows up your pan, which is fine. Don't freak out. That, that's perfectly normal. Because what's happening is the proteins from the, and the fat in the cream and the butter are binding together with the sugar molecules and it's kind of, I, I'm sure you've all heard the uh, current buzzword gluten, where you know gluten is like a stretchy thing when you uh, make bread and it's kind of similar to that because it's changing the molecular bonding in the, in the caramel. But that's why you get a chewy as opposed to a crunchy hard cake. So, and it gives a great flavor. Now here's where you get really specialized, unique techniques. Marshmallows. Have any of you had homemade marshmallows before? Yes, yes, you have, of course. Um, I've been perfecting this recipe. The very first year I made them, I made them with a hand mixer, electric hand mixer. And you can make them at home with an electric hand mixer. They're not gonna whip up as high. You'll, you'll get kind of a flatter marshmallow, which is still perfectly tasty. If you <clears throat> have a standing mixer, which my, I come from a culinary family and we probably have every gadget you can think of, we do have a standing mixer. Highly recommend using a standing mixer. Be prepared to get sugar and marshmallow all over your kitchen, but highly recommend a standing mixer. mixer. If you want to go ahead and hand out the marshmallows. The small ones, because I didn't feel like cutting uh, large craft marshmallows this year, the small ones are the store-bought, and then the square ones are the homemade. Yeah, and if you want to bring the gentleman the other two candies. Now, what goes into the marshmallows is three packages of unflavored gelatin, a cup of ice-cold water divided. You're going to use part of it to bloom your gelatin, the other part of it for making the syrup. You have a cup and a half of granulated sugar, a cup of light corn syrup. The, the substance on your fingers is cornstarch and powdered sugar. 
And I'm going to go ahead and say now that when they tell you to powder your pan, powder your pan. There is no such thing as too much powder. There is such a thing as too little. But yes, powder the heck out of your pan. Uh, it also has a quarter teaspoon of kosher salt, a teaspoon of vanilla extract. You can put whatever flavoring into them that you want. Uh, and then for the outside powder is equal parts of confectioner sugar or powdered sugar and cornstarch. Now, pretty much the process goes, you start your gelatin in your mixing bowl, whether you're using a standing mixer or handheld. You do have to, they call it blooming, where you soak it in water first so that it doesn't just have chunky little chunks of gelatin all throughout your marshmallow. Then you cook your syrup, you slowly add your syrup while beating your marshmallows, and then you beat them for 15 minutes. What happens is that as you are beating them, you're introducing air. You're whipping air into the mass that is in your bowl. The longer you beat it, the more air gets worked in, and it starts to cool down, which allows the air to kind of puff out and, you know, chill the gelatin so that it holds its shape. Now, the reason why a hand mixer, an electric hand mixer, I specify electric because you do not want to sit there cranking. There is no way you're going to be cranking enough to get, you'll wind up with nougat instead of marshmallow. But uh, the electric hand mixer doesn't move as quickly as the standing mixer, so less air gets introduced by the time it cools down, and it just it does not rise as high. It still is tasty, but it is nowhere near as large and puffy. And you know, like I said, you, you like a good puffy marshmallow, uh, unless you're, if you're doing the small ones, the secret of the small ones is a piping bag. And then you just squirt it out in line and chop them all up. And you can do small ones. The square ones, you put them in a baking pan, powder the heck out of it. Powder, powder, powder. The last two times, not this past time, I said, ah, I don't need to worry about powdering too much. The first time I just kind of threw some powder in there, shook it around, poured my stuff in, could not get it out of the pan to save my life. Had to, like, peel it out. It wound up with stuff all over the pan, all over my fingers. The marshmallows did not look fantastic. And since that was the first year I used <coughs> excuse me, the handheld mixer, they weren't as high. So they were really rough looking. Then last year I made it with the standing mixer. Powdered what I thought was an adequate amount of powder. Still had to kind of peel them out of the pan. Fortunately, they were thicker. Didn't look as rough, but still a little rough. This year, the recipe says to use a quarter cup of confectioner sugar, a quarter cup of cornstarch, <coughs> goodness, to mix that together, use part of it to powder the pan, the other part to powder the marshmallows as you're cutting them. I poured that whole thing in the pan. You spray the pan lightly with uh, whatever cooking spray, and you know, lightly means lightly. You don't want to make corn powder, you know, cornstarch mush in the bottom of your pan. Poured everything in there. Shook it, tilted it, you know, made sure there was a thick layer of the powder. When I poured my marshmallow in, let it sit for four hours, and then went and flipped it out, came right out of the pan. She will tell you, if she were awake, that I, I was celebrating. I took pictures. I posted on Instagram. I was like, yes, we got the marshmallows done correctly this year. It was fantastic. But it is, you know, everything is trial and error. And don't be afraid to experiment. So I made the marshmallows and I cut them. When you make the marshmallows, you mix everything up. And the last minute of mixing is when you add your flavor. If you want to put color in it, you can add your color. I've, uh, last year, Anacrocon was around Valentine's Day. If I was not snowed in and had the ingredients, I would have made heart-shaped pink strawberry-flavored marshmallows, along with the regular white marshmallows. These are just lightly vanilla-flavored. But yeah, you can add whatever. You can add mint. Uh, right now we're talking in my house about Christmas time. We're going to do mint marshmallows dipped in dark chocolate. This is very acceptable. <laughs> so, yeah, you just... What? Squish. Go over there if you want to talk to her. Thank you. Um, but yeah, feel free to experiment with the flavors. Anytime it says that this is the flavor you add to it at this point... That, that point is where you've gotten past the, you want to be kind of careful about what you're doing. Just toss anything in there, except maybe rose water. And I think that is all I've got. Um, if all else fails, enjoy your mistakes.
because, like I said, it's really difficult to uh, screw it up in such a way that you can't eat it. And, and someone you, you'll find somebody who's willing to eat just about anything you make. Does anyone have any questions about candy making or cooking in general? Because I, yes, sir. With your, you know, making your stomach, you're giving it up in temperature. Mm -hmm. If you turn off the heat, will it still carry heat? It, it will carry heat. When you turn off the heat, you want to take it off the burner. Because the longer it sits on the burner, it's going to come up a couple more degrees. And as I mentioned before, it, a couple of degrees can, can make or break your candy, literally. If you get it just slightly too high, you're going to wind up with a much harder caramel. Um, the girls, when they were wrapping the simple caramels, they discovered that it was almost too hard to cut. Once you get it in your mouth, you start chewing it, it warms up and you know becomes nice and melty and everything else. But when you're attempting to cut it in a room temperature pan or a cold pan, if it's in the middle of February, you may have to warm it slightly if you got it just those two degrees too high. And so really, when you're getting close, be prepared to pull it off the burner. Be prepared to do whatever you need to do next. Don't be, you know, don't think that, oh, okay, I'll have a minute to, now I can grab my butter and measure out my, my uh, cream and everything else. No, have that stuff ready to go as soon as your syrup is ready. You can just toss everything in there. I think that this recipe actually has you cooking everything at once. Uh, the salted caramel recipe, you're actually, you simmer the butter and then the, um, the butter and the cream and whatever alcohol you put into it. I make three types. I make with the Tennessee Honey Jack Daniels. I make it with Crown Royal Maple Bourbon. And I have made it with black rum which it, it kind of lends a slightly oaky flavor, which is interesting and maybe not exactly what you're looking for in a caramel. And then I salt it with different colors of salt. You couldn't really see the salt on this batch. They disappeared in the wrapping process, but black salt on black rum caramels is really striking and slightly alarming to people who don't know what black salt is. So, yes, you, you definitely don't want to let it sit on your burner Unless you're using maybe an induction oven, because like the, you tried it with an induction? No, I haven't got one. So. Yeah, uh, unfortunately I don't have one either, so I've never really experienced with induction. But according to what I've read, induction, that once you turn it off, it should stop. But you still want to just be on the safe side, pull it off and put it down on something that's not hot. Let's see if there's anything else I can think of off the top of my head while you kind people are thinking of questions. Or if you want more samples. There's plenty. I just ask that a few marshmallows are left behind because I have promised people that I would take marshmallows to them. Uh, the hard candies are tasty. Let's see, what other candies have I attempted making? I'm sorry? I've never attempted making gummy bears. Uh, gummy bears, you, you would need a mold unless you just wanted to make the uh, gummy. I know that... You would use a gelatin. It'd basically be a marshmallow without whipping it. So you would add the gelatin, you'd add the syrup, and then you would just pour it into your mold because it's the introduction of air that makes a marshmallow fluffy. So if you just pour it into your mold, chances are pretty good that you're just going to get you know, a, a gummy. It'd be like making jello where you take your powdered gelatin and you take your liquid and you combine them and then you get jello. Well, you're going to use less liquid because the less liquid you get, the harder the uh, resulting item is going to be. So yeah, you can definitely make gummy bears or you know gummy fruits or candies. And you can actually make a gummy fruit candy using only <coughs> fruit. Like you, you can make candies strictly using fruit and no actual sugars. You're going to get a much softer product because the granulated sugar is what gives it its good firmness. But if you're looking to do like an all-natural sugar-free in the sense that you're not adding sugar to it, cook up an entire batch of strawberries. And then cook them down and cut it up and strain it. Well, you'd strain it before you cut it up. But yeah, and then, and then you'd wind with like a kind of a gummy texture. I recently received a book on making gummy candies that I've tried experimenting with a little bit, but I haven't gotten ex familiar enough to bring anything to a convention. I don't like bringing stuff that doesn't taste good. 
because, yeah. Although I should one year just to go, okay, hey, everybody makes mistakes. Um, if you want to risk it, go for go for that. But um, um, I've also done Jello shots, which the you know, with the caramels. I the salted whiskey caramel recipe that I use is different from the simple caramel recipe. And the first year I made it, I attempted to make with and without salt and with and without alcohol. And the without alcohol versions wound up being hard, and I'm still not entirely certain of whether that was because I cooked them incorrectly, because it was literally my first time making caramels, and I got this fantastic notion that I was going to make all this salted whiskey caramel <laughs> and take it to a completely different convention and show off. And um, first pan was sauce. I was not using a digital thermometer. The second pan was perfect, except that it was a little too soft when I flipped it out and started cutting it, and I flipped it out on cooking, cooking uh, cutting board. So I put the cutting board in the fridge, and when I pulled the cutting board out, it was kind of stuck to the cutting board, and I started pulling it off the cutting board as the large brick, and it flipped off onto the floor. And all I had left were two strips that I had already cut when it was still soft, so I had maybe 14 pieces of candy. Because the next two batches, which were without the alcohol, turned into toffee. It was still delicious. People at the convention still raved about it and took it home and broke it up and put it over the ice cream. I don't know what they did with it. But I told them, take it. I, I don't want to see my mistake. And I don't know if it was because I didn't add the alcohol and the alcohol was necessary for the recipe to work properly, or if it's because I just cooked it too long because I couldn't read the thermometer properly. It was just a regular... Uh, up-down mercury thermometer. Now, last year I did a panel on cooking with alcohol, which, you know, alcohol does change your recipe in certain ways depending on what you're making and what alcohol you're using, whether you're just using it for flavoring or whether you're using it actually as an ingredient to do something in your recipe, which is why I'm not certain. Technically, the amount of alcohol put into a batch of the whiskey caramels should not be enough to affect the recipe, but candy is such a finicky thing that it could have. It's only about an ounce and a half that goes into that batch. So again, it shouldn't, but it could have. So if you use a recipe that involves alcohol, make sure that if you're taking the alcohol out, it's not going to affect your recipe. Make it, make it normally at first with the alcohol. If you are not putting the alcohol in for whatever reason, whether you know you personally can't have alcohol due to medication or just personal preferences, or if you're taking it to someone who can't have alcohol, um, maybe find a different recipe. The, the Internet is a beautiful thing. You can find recipes for just about everything. Um, you can find 500 recipes for key lime pie ranging from the most simple, which just uses eggs, condensed milk, and key lime juice, to the most elaborate, and then some really creepy ones that use powdered jello mix and just bother me for some reason. But, yeah, that, that's, that's pretty much that. Um, I, I mentioned at the start of the panel the whiskey caramels, you know, they only have an ounce and a half. I don't have any problem giving it to children. You know, some people may consider, oh, there's alcohol in it. I'd be more concerned about the amount of sugar, cream, and butter in the recipe than I would be about the amount of alcohol. But again, some people, you know, some people are sensitive. Uh, the reason I chose the three candies that I did, not just because of the process that they are made, but because the hard candies are lactose and vegan friendly. So, like, if you have lactose allergies or if you can't eat you know, animal products, the hard candies are fantastic for that. The caramels, you know, if you're lactose intolerant, you do not want to eat caramels because basically it's cream and butter out the yin You can make them vegetarian. I've made them using soy milk or almond milk and, you know, that lovely non-lactose or non-dairy product spread. Um, they're not terrible. They're not caramels. But they're not terrible, and I guess if you, you know, if you're lactose intolerant or if you're a vegan, you know, they're good, and that is an option that you have. And then with the marshmallows, while they don't have any lactose in them, they do have gelatin, which very often is derived from animals. So, you know, if you're vegan, you don't want to eat marshmallows. There are marshmallow products that you can make 
using like agar agar or uh, I, I cannot pronounce the word for the seaweed derived gelatin base they will be slightly different in texture agar agar tend to be a little chewier mm. so they won't be nice and fluffy mm. uh, but they're still tasty I mean most most of the things you make they're going to be tasty either way so enjoy no no questions uh, let's see still have it's 1145 and I've not seen the next panel show up so I could I could just talk about a little culinary excitement I mentioned black salt uh, my household has both black salt and white pepper so that's kind of interesting <laughs> to to throw out there we have pink salt red salt black salt gray salt uh, flavored salts, seasoned salts. I'm a salt fanatic. I could talk all day about salt. Uh, they don't want me to do that here, though. It's, I guess salt's not steampunky. I don't know. I need to find a culinary convention. And then you have um, different flavorings. We have the cinnamon, mint, almond. You can find, around, especially around the holidays, the holidays are the best time to find flavorings to add to candies. Uh, and then they last for a good long time. So if you want to wait till like just after Christmas when everything's on sale, stock up on your peppermint, your, you know, spearmint, cinnamon, butter rum, you know, yeah, if you don't, if you don't want alcohol in your food but you still kind of want the flavor, then <coughs> rum flavored extract is fantastic for that. I prefer real rum, but, you know, that's me. And uh, yeah, I definitely recommend shopping for that sort of stuff around Christmas time. Buy your sugar in bulk. You will be going through a lot of it. Um, every batch of caramels I make uses a cup and a half. Uh, you probably get about a pound and a quarter of caramels out of a single batch. And if you're making different flavors, you know, the cup and a half adds up real quick. Especially since nowadays the... Um, Sugar no longer comes in a five-pound bag. It generally comes in a four-pound bag because that's kind of how they try to make you feel better about buying it. They can't raise the price, so they just lower the amount that you're buying at a time. If you have access to a culinary store, we have one called the Chef's Store in Columbia. You can buy a 20-pound bag of sugar, you know, one-pound bricks of butter, entire quarts of cream, there was, there was a period of time when I was selling caramels on Etsy for $30 a pound, and people were actually paying $30 a pound for a caramel. I, I don't know. I guess they liked them. They buy the smaller sample version, and they come back and buy some more. So I guess it worked out. But it got to be a little much, especially when you start getting people who are having weddings in two weeks, and they want you to provide 200 pounds of caramel. And it's kind of like, um, I'm just me. And your wedding's in two weeks, and if I'm lucky, I can get 30 pounds out in a week. Because I did that for a convention last year. I, I'm not doing that for anything less than, like, you know, $700. You're really prepared to spend $700 just on candy. I, some people are. But I, I, if it were up to me at that point, I'd just go buy them off the shelf. Pretty pretty much the, the important thing is it does take time. It does take a little bit of specialized equipment, not that much, unless you're making something really extravagant. And it's, you're going to burn yourself. Sugar, when you're cooking at temperatures of 250 to 300 degrees, it spatters, you're pouring it, it splashes, the pans get hot, you know, you're, you're, you can't resist tasting it before it's, you know, ready to eat. Yeah, but... That's cooking in general. You're going to burn yourself with cooking in general. If you're afraid of getting hurt, then you pretty much just need to, well, I would say sit and read a book, but you could get a paper cut. So, unless you're doing digital. Yeah. And then that's not the same. Anything else? Any questions about anything? I did, I did a panel on Japanese snack foods for Anime Weekend Atlanta. Not last year, but the year before, so I could talk about Pocky. <laughs> You can make Pocky at home. It's not fun. And it's not as easy as just buying it, but you can make it. It's kind of impressive. Yeah, I made this. Uh, melon bread. 
which is kind of confusing because it, it's actually two, it's like sugar cookie and bread in one, but they meld together, so it's really, you're like you're eating, you're like, oh, how does that crust get on there? It's because you're rolling out the cookie, sugar cookie dough and putting it on top of your uncooked dough balls, and it's scary. It's very scary. And the recipe I found was not very well explained unless you've cooked before or baked before and you understand that you maybe don't want to chill one dough for four hours while you've got the other one ready to cook. You know, um, you make ramen at home. It takes days. <laughs> well, real good, good ramen takes days. You can make it simpler, but if you want the kind that you see um, you know, in anime with all the good vegetables and the kind of just shiny texture on the top. You're boiling bones and, and you know, breaking things down. Not quite gotten up to the point of making ramen just because we've got a ramen shop in Columbia. If I want it, I can go get it. <laughs> yeah, that's about it. Anyone have anything that they might want me to look into candy making wise? I've had people in the past ask about I mentioned uh, the sugar-free fruit candies. Someone asked me if you can make sugar-free sugar-free candies, like for diabetics. Um, really, by the time you get done with all the chemicals that go into it, you may as well just buy it because you're getting chemicals either way. You, I'm afraid to say if you're diabetic, you're going to be buying a lot of store-bought stuff if you really want the sweet thing because even the fruit candies have a high amount of fruit in it that will set off insulin levels. So, but yeah, I've been asked about that. The uh, information about the vegan marshmallows I've been asked about in the past. So, if you have anything you want me to look into or like a suggestion for, I forgot my business cards, um, a suggestion for candies that you would like me to make and bring next year, plan on being at Nacricon next year, my, my repeat viewers. Um, I'd be more than happy to bring in some other kind of candy. Uh, they seem to have gotten away from the chocolate panels. I, I hadn't been doing chocolate because there were other people much more experienced than I who had been doing chocolate panels, and I don't remember seeing any on the, the list this year. So I might start thinking about doing chocolate, which is fun and exciting. Oh, uh, yeah. It's, it's uh, I would do everything. I would do um, completely from scratch. I would do chocolate dip to get my marshmallows with chocolate coatings. I might be not wanting to do white chocolate just because I personally have an ethical problem with it. It's not really chocolate. I call it mocklet because, you know, it's mock chocolate. It mocks you. It's not the greatest thing. But um, I guess if people really wanted it, I'd attempt it. It has cocoa butter, but that's not the same. Yeah, so um, it's uh, 11.53. I still don't see the next panel, but uh, you guys maybe have other places to go. If you want to come up and ask me a question, I'm about to turn all the cameras off, and you don't have to worry about being on film. But yeah, if you want to look me up, I am on Instagram, Tumblr, Twitter, Facebook. I think I'm on Pinterest, too, but I never really use Pinterest, because I just, you know, being on Instagram, Tumblr, Twitter, and Facebook, Pinterest is just kind of an extra thing I don't need. And I'm on YouTube. So thank you for attending. What's your email? Also SDR. Yeah. SDR at Gmail. Yes. E S D E E A R. Which is just my initials spelled phonetically. Yeah. Really easy to remember. When I decided I needed a new a new uh 